and comedian Dave Spike is to get a few words. Hi Dave, it's brilliant to meet you. You too, my friend, you too. Thanks for coming. And thank you for letting me in your house. <laughs> my host, this. this is my house. Spike is not your real surname. How did this come about? <laughs> okay, long story short. Uh, and it's, it's quite obvious, really, when I was a kid. Uh, the trend was to have one of these... The, the, you put a thing on your head and you shaved your hair like that. Well, you didn't. Barbara did it, obviously. And uh, my hair was, for a long while, was very spiky. And people used to call me Spike at work. And then, as when I started doing comedy, uh, I got together with a friend of mine because I didn't want to do it on my own. So I found a double act. And he was called Rich, Richard Sykes, Rick Sykes. And his nickname was Psyche because he was, he was a bit mad. So when we got the double act together... We went, it was quite obvious we were going to call it Spiky and Psychic, which is which is a stupid name. Of course it is. Um, but then you, in the day, you had to get your equity card. So you had to register and do all these auditions for equity. So the name on my equity card was, was Dave Spiky. And so I thought I might as well stick with it because it's quite memorable. Dave's right, though. Dave's my name. How did you get into comedy? Oh, no, then. So long story short, very long story short. I'm going to rush now. Um, I was blessed, right? I was growing up, working class, you know, two up, two down, outside toilet, all that. And my dad uh, was a brilliant man, and he was a pension decorator, no job too small, estimates free. And um, and he was into his everything. He had no academic qualifications, but I was the oldest, and so he decided to self-educate, and he got into, like, classical music, and he got into, like... Um, Art, and, he, and he took to art galleries, but he loved, and the point is, he loved his radio comedy, which was the big deal at the time. But this before we had a telly, you know, I didn't have a telly until I was about 12. And, um, and so I was listening to Round the Horn and the Clitheroe Kid, people might remember these, and the Navy Lark, and, you know, the Goon Show, and stuff like that on the radio. And so that's like, they call it a theatre of the mind, don't they? Because you're imagining these performances, you're imagining these situations. So when I was at school and I was doing my essays, because my dad used to write short stories as well. Um, I'd get really good marks on my essays, but the comment on the bottom would always be, another great essay from Dave, but why does everything have to have a comedy element? And I didn't realise I was doing it. I was just, that was the way I saw life because of the way I've been brought up and it was skewed towards comedy. So that's part one. So part two is because um, of my, I was blessed with my academically gifted uh, parents who, who had no qualifications, I must say, I went to grammar school, and then I wanted to be a doctor, and then my dad had an accident, he um, was a pension decorator, as I said, and he was, he was, my dad's claim to fame, honestly, was he painted the hands on the town hall clock in Bolton. What he doesn't tell anybody when he's bragging about it is, he fell off while I was doing it, while he was doing it. Um, well, he was half past six, he had nothing, to, he had nothing to hold on to. Quarter past, he just had a chance, wasn't he? Um, but, no, so he did, he had an accident, my dad. And uh, I had to leave school, and I went working in the hospital. It is going on a bit, isn't it? So I was in the hospital, and I, went, and I got into haematology, and I got into biomedical science, and I was there for 32 years. And in the midst of it all, I got involved in the Amateur Dramatic Society. Um, just writing and directing. I didn't want to be on stage. I wanted to go to rehearsals and meet nurses and get drunk, basically. And um, so, uh, so uh, yeah... And, and then I, somebody dropped out, so I had to go on stage, and I, I was terrified. I didn't want to do it. And I came off, and there was a girl, a nurse called Abigail Todd, who was, bless her, was <laughs> a bit dim, really. Uh, Abigail Todd, she came for rehearsals, and she said, my name's Abigail Todd, but don't call me Abigail. I won't answer to Abigail. I hate Abigail. Just call me Abby. And, uh, and so I said, yeah, I will do, but you know you're called a bit odd now, don't you, Abby Todd? Um, and it was her that when I came off stage, after doing this, when somebody dropped out, she said, you're really funny, you should be a comedian. And for some reason, I took her seriously. And so, this was late, uh, 1986, 1987, and so I went off doing talent shows. I did a talent show at Scarborough Opera House. It's not there now, it's a world of wicker. It's a shame, isn't it? Um, and yeah, and I got, and then I, I started doing talent shows and open mic spots. But I stayed at the hospital, I didn't leave the hospital until 2000. Uh, Friday the 13th, it was October, Friday the 13th, 2000. So I was doing the comedy in parallel. So, long answer to a short question. Would you say the industry has changed much since you started in the 90s? That's a good question because, yes, it has. It's, it's changed a lot because when I first started, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunities in this area, in the northwest. Uh, there were no... I hate doing that thing. Uh, there were no comedy clubs. There wasn't... Any, you know, it was like you had the Wicked Men's Clubs or you did, like, the uh, theatres. The Oxygen in Bolton had a, had a comedy night where you could go and uh, try out your comedy skills. 
Um, so I had to travel far and wide to try and get into the comedy scene. I tried to work in men's clubs. I didn't do very well. Um, I, did, I didn't, because, you know, I didn't do jokes. I didn't do, like, you can see the audience looking at me going, does he not know an Irishman? Does he not know, do you know, does he, has he not got a fat mother-in-law? And I just did, I was, I chatted and they didn't, I didn't really, it wasn't, I wasn't right for the Wicked Men's Clubs, but I got a lot of material for when I was writing Phoenix with Peter and Neil. Um, so then I had to go travelling, I'm working at the hospital, so I've hindered me, which is why it took me so long really to work my way up the ladder, like I finish work and I go down to Birmingham to a comedy club, or I go down to, I have to go down to London, just do an open spot on a Wednesday night, you know, f drive down after work and drive back and... Uh, so it was a long slog, but these days, as you probably know, nearly every, every town, certainly every city, has got three or four comedy clubs. Every town's got one, maybe one night a week. So you can just turn up if you think you've got that knack, you know, if you think you've got the gift of comedy, and you can just try it out, five minutes here, five minutes there, and without all that trial, you know, if you, if you like. Uh, so also, it's a massive industry. It's, 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 a, it's a proper profession isn't it now I mean, it's like when I started I had no ambition I just wanted to do well and I loved doing it and I had no plan I didn't want to do it for a living I had no ambition to you know be on telly or anything like that I just loved doing it but these days it, there is a seems to be a career structure where you go through stand up then you get onto panel shows then you get you know, and get writing and maybe you get a comedy drama or a sitcom get into acting and then get into films and stuff there seems to be a, a, a proper progression now and there wasn't, in, there wasn't in my day, it was just like random, just... Unless you were in London. If you were in London, it sort of existed. Your original job was in Bolton, work, was in Bolton General Hospital working as a biomedical scientist. Mm. Have you ever missed it? I do miss it. I mean, I, I was there 32 years and I was head of hematology. Oh, I. And that's uh, blood disorders and, uh, you know, diagnosing blood disorders, leukemias, lymphomas, all sorts of things. And so the problem was, and I loved it, don't get me wrong, when I, growing up I loved working in the hospital and I've got lots of material from, from that time. Um, but it was one big happy family and you went on in the wards and there was a lot of interaction, you knew all the staff and there were lots of parties and there were lots of social events. It was a brilliant place to be. But as you might imagine now, with the pressures of finance and staffing shortages and whatever, it's, I've still got friends who work there and they're not, they're not happy people living, uh, working there. Not living there, looking there. They don't live there, and um, but so yeah, it, it, I walked away, and I really never looked back. I feel a bit bad about that sometimes because I had got very, I had a, a blowing on trumpet. I'd got a special area of expertise in abnormal hemoglobin types and sickle cell disease and things like that. But I'd got into management, and I'd got to such a level where I spent half my time in meetings and doing health and safety and doing, you know, um, personal development plans and just spending, wasting my time while I should be in the lab doing the stuff I love. So it sort of came at the right time. They say things happen at the right time for the right reason, you know. Because I, I, I got offered a lot of jobs in comedy, not big jobs, but, you know, with agents saying move here and do that, well before I left. And I just thought, no, it's not right, it's not right. And then when it happened, it was right. You know, and I think, you know, you just wait for the right, right moment. Working with haematology, is that what helps you in Mastermind? Well, yeah, obviously. Mastermind, Celebrity Mastermind came along and said, uh, do you fancy it? And I said, yeah, I'll have a go at that. And they said, what's your specialist subject? I said, well, I'd like to do the red blood cell. Just the red blood cell. Because um, it was my, a hobby of mine, hobby, no, I was sort of obsessed with the red blood cell, which is a, a little, obviously, <laughs> we've got billions of the things, and they keep us alive. And they keep us alive by carrying oxygen. And yet they don't use oxygen. They don't respire. A red blood cell doesn't respire. It uses uh, uh, anaerobic uh, respiration, if you like. So it breaks down glucose. I'm not going to too much. Use the end of Mayroff pathway, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, to generate its energy. And yet it lives for 100 days, 120 days, and carries oxygen so that we can survive. And so it's a very, very, very complex cell. And when it goes wrong, it's even more complex, especially with the... Um, you know, genetic abnormalities, like I said, the sickle cell diseases and the thalassemias. So um, I was right into that and I said, so I want to do the red blood cell. And she, for a minute, she just had a bit of a minute. And then she said, it's a bit narrow. I said, narrow? A red blood cell, narrow. I never called it, it's microscopic, never mind, narrow. So she said, no, uh, they came back to me and said, well, you can do human blood. So it was a bit of a risk, really. It doesn't sound it, but it's a bit of a risk. Because if you think about it, human blood, isn't just the red blood cell that I was fascinated with and white blood cells and the haematology aspects of it there. You've got all the biochemistry of it. 
which is very, very complex that I didn't know anything about. You've got the immunology of it, you know, autoimmune response, which I had no idea of. You've got all the uh, microbiology of it, you know, all the sepsis and all the, all the bacterial infections of the blood. So, so I, it was a bit, I mean, people say, oh, you did hematology, but hematology is only like 20% of human blood. So it, it gave me a massive edge. But I think when everybody goes on Mastermind, they pick something they think they know quite well. I actually, if you watch it, <laughs> why would you? Um, but if you did watch it, I actually get more on my general knowledge than I get on my hematology, on the human blood. With you being on tour a lot, do you find it hard being away from home? Yes, I do. I like to, oh, I'm so pedantic. I'm so parochial. I do want to get back to my own bed. That's the most important thing for me now. So if you look at my current tour schedule, it's uh, the most is it's two and a half hours away. I just want to, I want to get home. I think also because there's, there's, there's another aspect to it. If you're working away, I found this over the years. Um, say I went down and I did, say I did Cardiff, then I did Bristol, then I did Bath, and all that. You're away for three nights, but you've got to be out of your hotel every morning at 11 o'clock. So you're just, you're just killing time, just moping around places until you can get back into the next hotel for the next night. And, um, and so I hate all that. I hate just that wasted time and being away from home. So yeah. Two and a half hours, it's got to be maximum. Maybe three, because my show finishes at ten. I always insist on an half seven show. I'm away by ten, so I can be on for one. Um, so I'm a, I, as an, I'm a real home bird. I love it. I love it being here. Having been, having been many places on tour, etc., what's the most memorable thing that's ever happened to you? Oh, God, that's a good question. That's put me on the spot, hasn't it? Um, okay. Uh, okay, let me think. I don't you fucking you can use this. Okay, so the great thing about this is that this job is that you get to tour the world. It's mad. So I got a gig in Dubai um, years back in the day, and I thought I'd take my wife. And uh, it was at the time of the Iran Iraq conflict. I always get confused which one. But one of them's next. I'm not very good at geography, although I passed all of them. Um, and one of them's right next door to Dubai. And the Americans were involved, and I've got invasion and all that. So we landed at Dubai Airport, and I'm looking forward to these gigs. And uh, my wife's with me, and the security's mad, and we have to queue up for like an hour. And we get there, and he gets my wife's passport, and uh, he, he looks at it like that, looks at it like that, and goes, okay. And he gets my passport, and looks at it like that, and looks at it again like that. And calls this bloke off with a machine gun, like that, and shows it him. And <laughs> so, my wife trying to be helpful said, It's a terrible photograph, isn't it? And they both look at her and went, I know he looks like a terrorist. I went, That's not helping. That is not helping. <laughs> That's absolutely gospel truth, that. Um, so, I, I, I need some notice on that question. I've got loads and loads of funny stuff. My wife also we got stopped for speeding one night and um, I'd had, uh, I'd not had a lot, but I'd had a couple of drinks back in the day. And this policeman stopped me and said, you know, I said, uh, any idea what speed you were going then? And I thought, if he doesn't know, I'm going to just haggle with him, basically. <laughs> Surely he should know. And I just, just having a laugh, really. So I said, I don't know, 25. He said, you're going 40. I said, well, like 26. So anyway, she leaned over and she went, uh, obviously don't argue with him when he's had a drink. <laughs> She's just joking. She's just joking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I haven't had a drink. What was your favourite venue? Um, I've been really lucky. Um, let me think. I think my favourite venues, I suppose it's got a bit of a sentimentality about it, is when the comedy clubs first started in Manchester, there was a club opened, that, uh, a bloke called Agraman Run. He called Agraman the Human Anagram. And he was the host, and he opened this club over the Southern Club in um, Charlton. And it used to be fantastic now, because it was like a Saturday Night Live thing, so you'd have comedy, then music, then comedy, then music. And um, it was a brilliant, brilliant night. And I, So I've always had a massive, massive, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Affection for that, for that space. But I've been lucky. I did, it's easy to say, I did the Royal Albert Hall. I've done the Palladium. Um, I suppose... Yeah, I suppose that, or the comedy store. The comedy store on a Saturday night, there's no better venue than it, and everybody's come for the comedy, it's, and it's an iconic, it's an iconic thing. Uh, so when I went down to London, and then I got I got picked up by the comedy store, um, and they started managing me, that was my, 
London home, if you like, and it was like amazing walking on that stage every night. Because it is, you've, everybody's seen the comedy store, haven't they? Everybody loves the comedy store. Probably not. If you could restart your Korean comedy, what would you do differently? Um, I'd, um, I'd, I'd not do a lot differently, really. I mean, I just think you've just got to be true to yourself. Early days, I took a lot of advice that I shouldn't have done. I, I borrowed material, um, or, or I, I, I bought material, uh, on some instances, off writers who it turned out to be not original. They they'd, nick, they'd nicked it off other comedians, um, and I did. I did. I did that a couple of times um, without knowing, obviously. And so I'd be very wary. I'd always, I'd always want to do. If I was doing it again, I'd make sure I'd written it. It was all my idea. It was all my thought. That's not to say that somebody else will have the same thought at some stage. Um, but early on, I hid behind a character, like I say, Spiky and Psyche, and I had this persona. And if you see me early uh, publicity photographs, I had glasses, I wore glasses, and I had a tash back in the day. And it was, I, I sort of portrayed myself as a bit of a victim, a bit of an innocent, a victim in marriage and a victim, I was a bit of a loser. So it was, I was sort of acting, I was back to acting really, and I wasn't, and it took me ages to become myself and think, what am I doing? Why don't, why don't, by that time I got the confidence of having a bit of success, and so... I think that's the main thing. I just try it from day one, just go on stage. It's the hardest thing to do. It's, it's just go on stage and just be like this, and just chatting like this. You've met many other comedians over the years. Who do you admire the most? Um, the, of the ones I've met, um, I like. Uh, I, I like so many of them. You know, um, I love Jimmy Carr, who I did uh, eight out of ten cats with for four years. Sean Lock for the same reason. Sean Lock's so quick. Uh, at the moment, Lee Mack. I love Lee Mack, he's so spontaneous on Would I Lie to You and all that. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of work with him early days on the circuit and that. Um, boom, boom, boom. I think that's probably, they'd be my top, they'd be my top. Th oh, I'd say I like Mickey Flan. I'll start that again. I like Mickey Flanagan a lot. Um, I think he's very natural, but he's that uh, bit of a geezer in me. But um, those are the four, probably. What is Johnny Vegas like to work with? Johnny is... You don't use the word genius so often, do you? He, he's um, he's a one-off. We all know that, Johnny. He's unpredictable, and um, he's I, there's nobody there's no black him. I, I love I love Johnny Vegas. Absolutely, he's one of my absolute favourite people as well. Um, and you know, I did this. I don't know if you remember. I did um, I wrote a sitcom called Dead Man Weds, uh, but a newspaper office. And Johnny uh, Johnny was like co co lead with me, in it, and he's just. On set with him, it's just like, what's going to happen next? And I remember one night, I hope I'm not... Every, everybody knows Johnny likes a drink, doesn't he? He likes a drink. And we were staying in Buxton, we were on location, and we were staying in Buxton, and uh, they had a record over the bar that the last order... Who was responsible for the le le latest ever last order at the bar? And I got up in the morning to go to breakfast, and I was like, Johnny Vegas, like, six o'clock that morning. And I know that we've got a really big scene, just me and him. And, I, and we got, to, got on set... And, uh, are you all right? Yeah, yeah. Can we do all these close-ups first? So I it just it did all my mid-shots and two-shots and close-ups while he just sat opposite me just reading the words like that. But as soon as we came on in, he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. I love him. Who's the funniest person you've ever met? Um, well, this is going to sound... It sounds a bit, a bit twee, this. The funniest person I've ever met is... Um, he's, not, he's not a comedian. Comedians off stage. The ones that try to be funny off stage aren't, aren't my favourites. You know, like I work with some, especially the old school comedians. They're never off. They're never off. They're trying to make you laugh all the thing, all the time. So um, when you talk about it, like in, a, in, a, in a normal situation, who's the funniest person? Is my mate Paul from the pub down here. He's a pension decorator, and I based I wrote a sitcom, uh, it was a, a comedy drama uh, for comedy players called Magnolia. Um, years ago and it was all my dad was a pension decorator so my wife's dad was a pension decorator and my mate Paul's he's just a natural comedian and he's got I mean I'll probably see him in the pub tonight later on he's just he never he's not thinking about it he's just naturally got funny bones and everything he says he's always looking for the comedy effect you know he'd say um can I swear on this if I'm quoting if I'm quoting my mate he just comes out with some diamonds he just said uh, he came in the pub the other night he's and I say he's got all these pension decorators and stuff like so, all right, Paul, how's it gone? It's over, let's leave it at that. Like deadpan. Okay, all right. Gets a pint in. I said, so, not, not such a good day. He said, just when, just when you think you've hit rock bottom, you find a trap door. And that's just, that's just genius, you know. 
But he has. We're not. We're talking because you get in a situation with lads, don't you? In a, and you're trying to be funny. You're trying to top each other all the time to get the biggest laugh, get the biggest laugh over anything. Or you go in there at my pub at night, they'll be talking about Chechnyan rebels and pallet sizes in Europe and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. And, and so it, it gets into a bit of a competition and Paul always wins. He he's just comes out of left field every time. My mate Paul, funniest man. Do you still keep in touch from, with co-stars from the Phoenix Night days? Um, not really. No, I mean, people assume because you make something that's iconic like that that you're all best mates. And it's not it's a job like any other. We had a fantastic time doing it. Um, having said that, I've written, um, and I'm, I'm still in touch with, I'm writing with, um, Neil Fitzmorris, who uh, obviously co-wrote it. I see Justin Morris reasonably uh, quite often, um, and Toby Foster now and again, Steve Edge now and again, Janice, Janice Conley. He was on Britain's Got Talent the other night, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was. Um, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just a job. And I, The other thing was, and what people... Well, maybe over Luke, I don't know, is I'm sort of different generation. I came into it, as we, as we discussed, I came into it quite late, whereas they're all like, they could all be my kids, basically. You know, strange to say, I mean, they're all um, near enough. Um, so there's that, we don't, we didn't ever did socialise outside Phoenix Nights. I mean, I met, I meet Neil quite a lot for writing meetings and meeting production companies and stuff, but we never, we'd never go out at night for a few pints. Well, because we all live all over the place as well. There's a geography comes into it, but but yeah, no, that, that yeah, but no, yeah, but no, but yeah, but yeah. So you've been on television a lot. What was your best moment on a panel show? Oh, I see, he's coming up with some good questions here. Um, I don't know. I found. <laughs> have I had one? Um, <laughs> have I had a best moment? A best moment. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not. Not in, in terms of experience, or rather than in terms of my funniest line or whatever, funniest one line. Um, my best experience was on 8 out of 10 cats, um, where I had some fantastic guests on my team. And one of them, when you get a hero sat next, I mean an absolute hero sat next to you, um, and which happened twice to me, um, John Rivers is you know, the top, top American comedian, probably of all time. I've read all her autobiographies. She's got a fascinating life, fascinating woman altogether. And uh, and I found out she was going to be on my team. So I, I've got an old auto, a battered autobiography of hers that I've had from day one. And I was so, I was terrified of being with her and she was sat on my side here. And um, during one of the breaks in recording, I just said, Joan, do you mind, do you mind just signing that for me? And she said, Joan Rivers actually signed my book and put a lovely thing in it, lovely, about the, where the recording was going. And that was lovely. And then the year after she did so well, the assets come back again and she said, only if I can be on Dave's team. Joan Rivers. Ah. You were cast as the new presenter for Bullseye. Was it hard not using all Jim Bowen's catchphrases? I turned it down a couple of times. Um, it, I thought it was a bit of a poison chalice. Chalice? Chalice. I thought it was a poison. Can you edit this? I thought it was a poison chalice. Um, I mean, he is Mr. Bullseye. Bullseye is, is one of my favourite ever, ever game shows. I'm not just saying that. I'm, I think it's great because you don't have to be a mastermind to win it. You don't have to be the best dirt player to win it. You can even win it if you come third <laughs> and the first two decide not to gamble, um, which happened on one... And I did this show and the first couple had won loads of prizes and uh, no, we're not gamble, we're not gamble. And then the second couple came along and they'd won a couple of good prizes and a bit of money. And they went, no, we're not gambling. And I went, okay. So I went to this guy, these two guys who like won 20 quid and a, and a, and a crew it set. And I said, so you're going to gamble? No, we've had a good day. I went, no, you've got to gamble. Somebody's got to gamble. And we had to pay him to gamble. Um, but no, it was, I thought it was a poison chalice because he is, he is Mr. Bullseye. If, somebody, if anybody's doing it, it should be Jim Bowen. And they came, came back to me and said, we well, can't do it. Um, we're going to do so many shows a day, whatever. And uh, he, he's, he can't do this. He can't make the schedule. Whatever. So, now, so eventually I thought, well, if somebody's going to do it, it might as well be me because I love it. Um, and so I thought, I, sit, I sat down with Tony Green and sort of wrote, if you like, my own catchphrases because Bullseye's renowned for them, isn't it? You know? So we tried to write a couple, but basically just thought we're going to have to take it in a slightly different direction. So instead what we did was... I don't know if you've watched it, is at the opening of every show, we did a little stunt or a little chat, me and Tony. We rigged up, the prop guys rigged up, um, I don't know if you've seen this one, a dirt on a on a piece of spring that I had just inside my shirt and a thing like that. And uh, I had, uh, I said, Tony, you never throw, you never throw. And 
go and have a throw. And he, he just so he obviously focuses it on him. And as he, as he throws it like that, he cuts to me and I just pull a string and this duck comes out of my chest like that. I've got no way I never thrown it. So we do it just to get on a different, slightly different direction. It wasn't to everybody's liking, but I did about 40 shows and I think most of them were all right. I got a lot of stick on social media, but I got a lot of nice comments as well. I think the Times said the natural, you know, her to uh, Jim Bowen, which was really, really nice, but a lot of people didn't agree. If I was to pursue a career in comedy, what advice would you give me? Um, I, um, I think I've probably, I've mentioned it before, is, and it's the most difficult thing in the world, is to be yourself. And don't, don't compromise, don't think, oh, everybody's laughing at that material about that, or that material about that, or social comments. Or, if you don't find it funny, they won't find it funny. They'll suss you out, basically. And so, you know, if, if you've seen it and it's made you laugh, they've seen it and it's made you laugh made them laugh and so it's your job then as a comedian to highlight that and elaborate and exaggerate it to the nth degree like if I'm in town in Charlie and something funny happens um, my wife will be in the pub at night and my wife will say oh tell Paul that thing that was funny so I'll tell him and then Mike will come in and Paul will say tell Mike about that on the market so I'll tell Mike and then Charlie will come in Charlie this is like 10 people later and every turn I'll be going where did the donkey come into it? Where's the nun? Of, and it's and oh, it's funny with the donkey in it, isn't it? Just you've got to. You just, this is the skill of a comedian is to make that, make that story bigger and better, so it makes people laugh out loud. Because you've got the comedy of association because they know it's happened, but it might have happened to them. But also, you know, you've made it a bit more ludicrous, really. What would you say is your ultimate ambition? I've never had an ambition. I know it sounds mad that I've not. I've not. I've been so lucky. This sounds a bit pretentious as well. But I worked in the NHS. I had no ambition to be a comedian. Uh, I had no ambition. I, even at, even at work, you, you know, I fell into biomedical science. I wanted to be a doctor. That never happened because I, I love working at the hospital. I never went back to my studies. I got offered university places doing medicine, but I decided I wanted to be part of a team and background. And I started questioning whether I would would make the grade as a doctor. I really, I seriously think I probably wouldn't be clever enough ultimately. And then, then with the comedy thing, just fell into that with the writing and directing, then having to stand. So I've never really looked beyond what I'm doing now and thought, oh, in the I wish I could do that, I wish I could do that. If, if you had to pin me down, my ambition would be to get another sitcom that I've made, a comedy drama that I've written, um, whether by myself, I'm writing with Neil, as I said, we wrote, we wrote a really good one that fell at the last hurdle called Glitterball, that both ITV and BBC loved, but then decided they didn't love it that much. <laughs> and uh, so my ambition would be to get one of them uh, made and direct it. I suppose that'd be it. That, then I've done everything, really. Will there be any more programmes like Dead Man Words? I wish there was. You know, I was so... You know, you, you, you feel as though you, you've not got... I've been so lucky that you... Feel a bit if you get a bit grumpy if you say no. There should have been a second series, but it was a major disappointment that because they made all the right noises and it was I think it was decent enough for a first series. I thought it was really good, um, but I wrote one with Neil Fitzmorris. Um, as I said, it's called Glitter Ball, and then we still got fingers crossed that someday that somebody will pick that up. It's about ballroom dancing in a Blackpool hotel. Um, we just figured you still get that same rivalry and that same elitism and snobbery at that level that you do it strictly you know and we i mean we wrote it two two or three years ago now but it is it, it is you know when you you know when you've done good work without it being big headed because you you're working that field and uh we cast alison stebman in it and keith baron god bless him he was in dead man where's he's passed now and passed away now and uh we had a great great time doing it and then as i said just at the last minute we pulled the plug on it um so Keep going, you just keep writing, what else can you do? And nothing's wasted. I'm writing with Jim Cartwright, Jim Cartwright who wrote Little Voice, who's a brilliant playwright, I'm writing a couple of things with him. And um, I've written one about a Sunday football team that I've asked Neil to have a look at. So you never stop, just keep cracking on, fingers crossed. You are the patron of Pet Rehome, Home, a local animal shelter. When you visit, you find it hard to come home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, the reason I'm, I'm patron of Pet Rehome, Home, I'm patron of... Um, Animals Asia and uh, what's the other one? What's the other one? It's, um, it's another ball and Pause for Kids, which is um, uh, domestic abuse. It's which which sounds a bit mad, but what it is is uh, uh, victims of uh, domestic abuse quite often stay in an abusive relationship, 
uh, because the other partner could be could be men, could be male, female. Uh, the other partner threatens the pet, threatens they're going to kill the pet or torture the pet if that person leaves them. You know, so uh, and then and most refugees don't take animals. So pet paws for kids, P A W S, which is a Bolton charity, which is unique, which I did pointless for, which uh, I won. Um, but um, yeah, so I did for paws for kids. They do. They'll take. Don't worry about that. Come with your dog or your cat or your rabbit or your whatever and we'll foster it for you, we'll find something to foster it for you while you get back on your feet, while you get in the refuge, while you find and make, make, make life all right for you, then you can have your pet back. So don't worry about that. So that's a Bolton charity, because so I'm a patron of that. Yeah, Pet Rehome, as you say, um, which is a brilliant charity, and um, a, a couple of others. But the reason is I used to have, out in the back garden, I used to have an animal sanctuary, and I used to have goats and chickens and sheep and all sorts of stuff. I had nine dogs at one time and cats. And, whatever, and a turkey called Bertie. And um, and when they, they all went, because I was touring and because I was going abroad and looking here, there and everywhere, I mean, I didn't get rid of them. When not, they died of natural causes, but I, I couldn't replace them, so I, I channeled those efforts into animal welfare and, uh, yeah, because, and animal charities. People say I'm funny. Well, when I say people, I mean person. <laughs> can I try a few of my jokes on you to see if you approve? Yes, you can indeed. Never buy shoes off a drug dealer. I do, I've been tripping all day. Yeah, see, it's good. <laughs> I went into a library and asked, and asked for a book about paranoia. The librarian said they're right behind you. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. I like that. Right. This is my favourite. My dog used to chase people on a bike. It got so bad I decided to take his bike away from him. <laughs> <laughs> it's great you just have this picture of a dog on a bike, don't you? No stabilisers, nothing. Like that. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope it was all right for you.